Uh, hi all of you, good morning. I'm Shabbir. I'm the CEO of co-founder of Educami. And my experience in education is what I want to share with all of you. Now, this is what I call as the great shoe pile up. Uh, it was a scene that I was used to in my college days. I've been a student of the 1990s when the computers were being reduced into our colleges. The computers would be housed in glass cabins and uh, we were allowed to access it only if we took out of our shoes. We would walk into the rooms sheepishly scared and not touch the computers at all because the fear that we might infect the computers because we carry with us viruses and pathogens. I was grateful that my professors never asked me to sanitize myself before entering the rooms. This was the story of the 1990s education where internet was being introduced. And since then, we have come a long, long way. Today, we talk about AR, VR, we talk about MOOCs, we talk about YouTube-based learning platforms. And it's exciting. It's almost like education getting transformed. But then, not everything is very right. In some ways, our system seems to be broken. Broken because of the type of trauma students face and the incidences of student, student suicides. Our Union Minister for State in the Parliament while answering to one of the questions said, 35,000 students have lost their lives between 2019 and 2021. And approximately 1.7 lakh students have committed suicide since 1995 and 2021. That is not just grim, it's scary. What is the society moving towards? On one hand, we talk about computers, new age learning, we're talking about Web 3.0, and other phase where students have stress, distress. ICMR and the World Bank tell us 12 to 13 percent of our students have problems of uh, mental and emotional instability. There are problems of behavioral issues. They are having problems of depression, anxiety. And mind you, these are just those that we are reporting. Something is amiss here. And in some ways, I see this as a crisis that has been unfolding. Crisis, why? Because if we don't address it timely, we are going to have a serious problem in education in our society. The crisis number one is that we are in a state where I call it as uh, a state of uh, uh, competent slack where we are kind of having an illusion of competence. Why I say illusion is because last couple of years, particularly through the COVID times, students are more used to studying from the screen. We are watching lectures, we are listening to podcasts, we are seeing mathematics, we are reading mathematics. I belong to an age, and many of us, I'm sure, will agree. Mathematics is supposed to be solved. You take a paper, you write down, you derive. We are looking at students who are used to watching experiments rather than doing experiments. So when we are exposing ourselves to that type of education, what happens is we kind of get familiar and we have a sense of competence, although we lack competence. And when the exam time comes in, we are supposed to write down answers. We must write down long essay type of compositions which are deep analysis based answers. There's a gap between what we think we are good at and how we are being tested. And not just this, we also have a problem in terms of our aspirations and our competence. The YouTubes, the social media, the internet has exposed us to humongous amount of possibilities for us. We now aspire, we dream, we have got great expectations about ourselves, but the skills that we require are grossly missing. Uh, we talk about uh, dream, act, achieve. The problem is not with the dreams. The problem is, are we acting and are we acting in the right way or not? The consequence of this gap is that we are being taught a lot of shortcuts. You've been taught hacking the system. As students, rather than learning the concept, rather than uh, understanding the concepts and learning and educating ourselves, we are learning how to game the system. We are learning how to hack the system. I was seeing on the videos, one of the teachers was teaching small children how to remember the capital of India is Delhi. She says, India, it has D, Dia, therefore capital is Delhi. But that logic, Pakistan's capital, Pakistan, Tan, Tanzania, capital of Pakistan, the capital of USA, Sa, Siberia maybe. 
So if this is the type of cues we are teaching students, we are messing up with their lives. So the stress factors are about the gap between the ambitions and the skills that we have. The gap between our own competent sense and what the exams are testing. And the worst problem is when the exams ultimately are written examinations. The exams demand a type of written skills which we are not able to develop. So how do we solve this? How do we answer these problems of incompetency and the stress factors? I think rather than teaching students the subject, we should also be teaching students how to study. Study is a process. Education is a method that evolves when you get into certain acts. I hear students about getting demotivated and the students are being motivated, they're counseled. I'm perfectly fine, let's counsel them. But more importantly, the act of education must convert into series of small, small tasks that can be measured. Series of small, small tasks that can be quantified and tracked. So education requires a process. Education requires a reboot. And in this process, a very important aspect is to understand that the lack of success for students is not because they are not willing to learn. One of the complaints I hear about students is the students don't want to learn. The students are not sincere. I say, no, they are sincere. They are intent in learning. I've been teaching students for almost 24 years for civil services. And I tell you, intent is not the issue at all. When students leave their homes, they give up their jobs, they come and live in shanty rooms. They are having the intent. They come and take admissions. They pay a hefty amount right through their nose. They have the intent. What they lack is a process. Now, this is a two by two uh, diagram that I create where I have axis X is about intent of learning. The axis Y is the process of effective learning. What we want is students should be in the first quadrant. The intent is high and the method, the process also should be high. Any gap in this, you'll find distress, you'll find escapism, you'll find help, uh, learned helplessness. Now, what does this process include? My pitch here is that motivation is fine, but motivation, sincerity, discipline are abstract ideas. What we must do is convert the abstract ideas into doable tasks. Doable tasks like write a summary. Doable tasks like solve a small recall sheet. A doable task like can you do a, come some kind of a workbook. And these doable tasks have to be done after the class. Most of us believe education happens in the classrooms. I say no. The classrooms only exposes you to a concept. The classroom maybe helps understand concept. The actual learning happens after the class. The series of post-class engagements. The series of activities after the class gets over. And these post-class activities have to be mentored by certain teachers who are trained. So my humble submission here is that in education, the concept of self-learning by video courses, I have serious problem about it. Education is something like health food. Good education is something like good lifestyle where we know what is to be done and sometimes we may not. But it cannot be achieved until I'm put through a process where I'm guided in terms of the steps that I need to do. What we call as guided processes. Why? Because who are we talking about? We're talking about young adolescents, teenagers, full of hormones and distractions. To tell them, this is a recorded video, go watch. I do not know how that works out. I am on the wrong side of 50. Even now, if you give me a recorded video to learn, I will fail dramatically. So what we need is, active engagement with teachers who engage in the students well-being and the learning the process is important the process is post class and the process has to be guided in my institute we have run certain type of activities that i call as post activity recall sessions and what i find is in those recall sessions the scores of the students dramatically increases when they start off the scores are less but when I sit down with them and guide them in the process of revisions, reading, their scores dram dramatically improve. This curve tells us some of those low points are the test scores just before those post-class activities. And once they administer that activities, the scores suddenly shoot up. And in this post-class activities, there's one more point that I want to emphasize on. There's an idea that because our attention spans are not more than 10, 12, 15 minutes, so study should also be for 10, 15, 20 minutes because attention span is barely for one hour. 
classes should not go on for one hour. I agree. But because our attention span is short does not mean that our study duration has to be short. I mean, some of you who are the good performance and you have done well in life will recall the best study was when you sat down at a stretch for six, seven hours. For a good education, learning of half an hour, you must sit for two hours. For a good education of one hour, you must sit for probably three hours. What I call as marathon in studies. You require intense you require immersive, you require sustained continuous sittings and wholesome sittings, not simply quick bursts of learning. The marathon session requires that you have to build up through some kind of endurance building. Endurance building where your muscles are strengthened, your muscles are made more and more resilient to sit and start performing. The problem is not that you don't have dreams. The problem is not that you don't act. The problem is the act process has to be right. When I talk about students who come to us for training into civil services, I find students are studying 7-8 hours a day. But the process methods are probably the main mistake why they end up into stress. So post-class activities, immersive studying, marathons is our way forward. The second problem that we would like to solve in terms of education is we must somehow get out of the timed examinations. Two hours of paper, three hours of paper. Yes, we must have a sense of time. But why do we have stress of time in terms of the papers getting snatched away from the students writing desk? School children, when you are having timed test, you are testing the stress taking ability, not the skills of education knowledge. Let the questions be less. Let us give them 10-15% more time. Let the students think through the answers rather than put them in the stress of time-based study. So the process required and get away with the time at least at the level of schools. Now talking about another very important aspect of education is creativity, innovations. I'm sure all of you agree with the idea that innovation and creativity is a hallmark of education. We cannot do away with it. Our NEP talks about that. That we must have creative, innovative ways of studying. My answer is, how do you do it? How do you do it? The answer is interdisciplinary approach. Students should be studying across subjects and we should do that. But the problem is, while the students are getting into interdisciplinary, the teachers continue to be mastering and specialized in one subject. At the school level, I think it probably is not correct where teachers teach only one subject and they're specialists, biology teacher, chemistry teacher, history teachers. At the school level, until a teacher learns to integrate things, the students cannot integrate things. I, in my uh, teaching setup, I am teaching geography, international relations, security, environment, and I also teach language and essays paper. And believe me, the teachers respect me more, the students accept me more, and my own understanding of issues is dramatically different if I was teaching only one subject. So interdisciplinary teaching is the key to creativity. A second very important aspect, unfortunately entirely ignored is language. Language is not simply for communication. Language is not simply to tell what you think. It's about emotions. Language controls our thought process. I'm quoting uh, Helen Keller in her book, The Story of My Life. She says, her teacher Anne Sullivan reached her hand into a flowing water and wrote water on her arm, W-A-T-E-R. And for the first time, Helen Keller associated the world with certain metaphorical representations of words and symbols. And she says, that one word, that living word, okay, awakened her soul. It gave her light. It gave her joy and hope. And finally, it set her free. Education requires expressions. I'm quoting Mr. Javed Akhtar. He says, Words are not thought, but words are building blocks of thought. Words are building blocks of making buildings. If your words are less, if your expressions of vocabulary are less, your house will be small. If a vocabulary is good, your house is going to be bigger. We need language skills, expression skills in our teaching processes. So if I'm looking at transforming education, we're looking at a process-driven approach, we're looking at post-class activities, marathon sessions, creativity through interdisciplinary approach, and more importantly, language skills. 
Teach the children words. Teach the children how to paraphrase and summarize using a range of vocabulary. And all of this, the most important link that we are trying to talk about is the concept of teaching and teachers. Teachers are the biggest piece of the puzzle. If we do not train teachers, teachers who are empathetic, teachers who are caring, teachers who are compassionate, you will never have education that can transform itself. In the words of Abul Kalam, he says that, uh, that the future of the country depends on teachers who are compassionate, who are innovative and most importantly, they have high self-esteem to run and drive an education process that is transforming. Thank you so much.